I'm sure we probably have a few thousand people watching already. Yeah, right. <laughs> so right there, let me turn things. We like we have a few dozen. Oh, we are going to kill. We are going to kill. Those Definitely. people watching right now, you lucky, lucky viewers, this is going to be awesome. Okay, let me turn that down. I'm almost there. Seconds away. Moments away. Okay, we don't have a thousand viewers. We have one. But that's all right, all right. guys. It's time. I'm going to start anyway if I may. So uh, I'll have you guys kicking it in the green room over there. Um, there's a sumptuous buffet over there uh, from what I hear. And so just kind of take care. I got to take care of a little housekeeping uh, before we get into the story of Keith and Amy Breedlove. Uh, we got them here today. I'm very, very excited to be talking to them. And uh, um, gosh, I feel like uh, it's been days since I've seen you guys. And so uh, yeah, that's awesome. So thanks for coming in, guys, by the way. And uh, yeah, like I said, just a little bit of housekeeping, okay? So um, I want to say we are just a small family food fake TV network over here at Industry Cooking Channel, okay? At one of the many fine channels over there on YouTube. You might want to check it out, okay? Uh, we take our time crafting wholesale kitchen entertainment the old-fashioned way with the freshest local ingredients combined with a little bit of essential kitchen wisdom, mixing in the list of humor and finishing with a little bit of love, okay? That is some tasty programming, okay? And speaking of tasty programming, I wanted to tempt your brain's taste buds with a selection of these fine upcoming shows that I got rolling in, okay? First of all, next Monday at 4 p.m., a Between Two Stoves interview with Localis Chef and Kitchen Enfant Terrible, um, Chris Barnum Dan, okay? Now, people throw these French terms out there, enfant, tarab, la, right, you know? But who really speaks French, right? So I looked this one up for you, okay? So enfant, tarab, la, okay? It's a new, a, usually a young, successful person. They are strikingly, strikingly unorthodox and innovative, which means innovative, and they are also avant-garde, okay? And so I looked up avant-garde too, okay? Another French term, it just steamrolls. You guys see where I'm going with this, right? So I gotta look up avant-garde, favoring or introducing experimental or unusual ideas, okay? So in summation, strikingly unorthodox, innovative or innovative, however you wanna pronounce that, uh, or ex and experimental, okay? This kind of sums up uh, what I think of Chef Chris over there at Localis, right? And the experience that most people see over there, right? Um, he is just uh, uh, this, this dark, mysterious artiste, but he's also a really, really cool guy that's right there front and center. He kind of runs a show every night, the way I see it, right? With, uh, uh, on top of running a restaurant. So he's gonna be here on Monday, that's Monday the 7th, that's Labor Day. And uh, you're gonna get the tiniest virtual taste of what Chef Chris's Localis is all about during these days of COVID. We gotta find out what he's doing now, okay? Uh, I got tons of shows, okay? So I gotta keep talking. I got another one in the pipeline. Longtime local chef, Ravine Patel is in Davis and Sacramento these days, okay? I wanna hear about his collaboration with longtime friend of the show, Food Literacy Center. Give it up for Food Literacy Center as well. Whoop, whoop. Um, so uh, we're going to be bringing in uh, Ravine Patel uh, very, very shortly, okay? Uh, just a little hint, uh, the show is going to feature bok choy, bok choy very prominently, okay? So that one's coming up. Uh, let's see other shows that we are kicking around in times of global pandemic, industry cooking, PBS channel, okay? This is another little side gig that I'm starting, okay? So now I got a PBS channel going, okay? And we feel that the general public would be very well served by taking a food safety course as a way to provide awareness on how to control microorganisms during food prep and storage, okay? I'm working on lining up an actual county restaurant inspector to talk about the latest COVID protocols. This is for restaurant people, but it's also for homeboys, right? And home people where the rubber meets the road in your own kitchen, right? So this show is essential watching for anybody who ever cooks food or anybody who ever eats food or anybody that really just puts anything in their mouth, quite honestly, okay? Um, I think it covers everybody. So just, just watch this one, okay? This one is going to be really, really cool. I don't have a date. It's in the pipeline, okay? Inspector, quit, set up. <laughs> we'll get you in there pretty soon, guys, but uh, I'm sure you guys are excited to hear all this stuff, right? 
Uh, let's see, I got another one. Keith, you're gonna like this one. Enough, you're gonna like this one, Keith, okay? We all hear about grass-fed beef, but I wanted to get local meat purveyor and radio voice talent, John Paul Corey, to do a show that presents <laughs> the other side of what I would call, you know, commodity beef production, okay? So I'm always going on about natural and grass-fed and everything. Hey, let's find out what it sounds like on the other side. So I'm gonna bring him on. He's a super funny guy. Um, this is gonna be a, 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 a little bit controversial, I think, right? To present what might be called the industry line here, okay? But um, uh, it's a sec it's a sensitive segment of our food system. I feel an introduction to the process, uh, to everyday commodity meat production is gonna kind of arm everyone with a little bit better tools to make dietary decisions, to discuss food sustainability, make better choices in what we eat, okay? So I'm really, really thankful to bring him on, longtime friend, John Paul Corey. I think uh, Keith knows him as well. And he's gonna be taking his time to add to the context. And he's also a really, really funny guy. He drives me crazy with all of his horrible, horrible puns, okay? So uh, I love this guy and, and we gotta bring him on. So that's gonna be another um, another show that I got going on, okay? Um, now, I'm still talking about new shows, okay? Network Brass is inking contracts as we speak to begin production on a new travel series on Industry Cooking Channel for the fall. I'm very, very excited about this, okay? Um, we're calling it Industry Cooking Ro Roadshow. It sounds like Antique Road. This is what we came up with, Carol? Okay. Okay, this is temporary, okay? Industry cooking roadshow, all right? But um, it just seems like our marketing department is phoning it in these days, okay? But since we're in a pandemic and since the show is, is really in its infancy, the board of directors has decided to start small with a pilgrimage to, I'm thinking East Sac or something like that, right? So we'll do a very special East Sac show on the uh, uh, new industry cooking Roadshow, okay? And if viewers can't get behind this, if Brass approves a budget, I may plan some far-flung junkets to actual exotic locations such as Del Paso Heights, Rancho Cordoba, and even Amador County, okay? And so that's all in the pipeline as well. I want you to tune in. I need to remind everyone. We have some great straight cooking shows in the pipeline as well. We're gonna be bringing in some local talent, of course, to lay down some basic Jedi kitchen mind tricks. I want you to keep an eye out for a hard hitting multi-part docu expose, finally explaining the ancient mysteries of breakfast cookery, um, eggs, bacon, and potatoes of the gods, okay? And so that'll be coming up soon as well. So. Um, gosh, other things in the pipeline. Sorry to make you wait, guys. Gosh, Keith and Amy breathe love hanging in the green. I, I appreciate you. I got to talk about all this stuff. Okay. So people have You're been asking about, people have been asking about merch. Okay. And so we are building an online gift boutique. Okay. It's very tasteful and, um, you can visit that. You can already go over there at industrycookingclasses.com, you know, but all of our merch, I'm going to bring in a new line, uh, uh, starting very, very soon. Okay. So watch for sweet t-shirts, coffee mugs. We're going to get, you know, the, the cool logo on there. And also Gwyneth Paltrow's line of essential stickers uh, for everyone. She's been talking about those a lot. Okay. So um, uh, all of it, all of it proclaiming your allegiance to the kitchen life with the only food logo that has been able to uncross and decouple the kitchen implements. I'll point out my hat, right? Everything's crossed, right? The only logo that has separated them, okay, right? Okay, I, we, we are very proud of that over here. Our design team worked for months on that one, months. I don't think you'll see another one or not too many out there, okay? So you can, um, you're, you're, you're just gonna have to uh, also, also look out on the website for Industry Girl, for you ladies, right? A, a line of fine fashion products and accessories designed strictly for the kitchen ladies, yo. Okay, so um, that, is, what's that? Because not everything works. How about some pants, ladies, with some pockets you can put stuff in? How about that, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd love to see that kind of stuff, all with that classy, classy industry logo, right? Makes fine gifts, right? Remember me around, remember it around Christmas time, okay? So, anyway, you can view quality culinary entertainments live on Industry Cooking Classes community page on Facebook. That's where we are right now. That's where we're watching. And you can also go ahead over to YouTube, 
to Industry Cooking Channel. You can subscribe and watch anything, anytime. Everything's free. I ain't making dime one on this stuff. Um, I'm just, I just want to get people cooking, right? I want to get people excited about food and get them up off their couch and into their kitchen, okay? So why not just go on over there and subscribe and subscribe your mom and your grandma when they're not looking. You know their passwords anyway, okay? And get over there to the cooking channel. Subscribe everybody to it. Uh, it's the sort of wholesome family food fake entertainment they would enjoy anyway. Okay, so um, before the next interview, before I bring these two on, I feel I should offer a serious disclaimer here, okay? My, myself and my guests today, we were volunteers at World Central Kitchen recently, and I wanted to discuss the experience as volunteers, okay? Um, I have not contacted World Central Kitchen about this interview, so I feel we should mention we are not officially a part of World Central Kitchen right here. We do not represent the organization in this chat. Views expressed are our own and not reflective of World Central Kitchen policies, procedures, or protocols. And I think we just made the corporate lawyers happy enough to kind of start the interview, okay? So now it is time, if we may, to nerd out with the Culla Nerdly Kitchen duo, Amy and Keith. Free love, if you would all give it up. I think the internet is going wild right now, but this is me, okay? How's it going, guys? I haven't seen you for a couple of days. Hi, Dave. Uh -huh. Oh, man. Man, um, so uh, I wanted to kind of uh, um, talk about the World Central Kitchen, just start off with that, because that's kind of where I really met you guys and everything. You've been volunteering at the Northern California Fires for years now, by the way. I want to give you guys a huge shout out in Sacramento, and the region should give you guys a huge shout out for showing out there. Uh, showing up there every year, taking your own trucks, as I truck as I recall, your own food out there and feeding people. You guys have huge, huge hearts, and um, I really want to give you uh, not a shout out, but a scream out. Okay, you guys are freaking yeah. awesome. Okay, thank um, you. Uh, uh, I wanted to um, kind of bring that World Central Kitchen kind of into this and just ask you as volunteers, you know, what's your opinion of World Central Kitchen as an organization? Thumbs up. Pretty. You know, it's really amazing. I mean, um, thumbs up. We met them originally back in the campfire, the Paradise Fires, a couple of years ago when they were small. They had just started up. Matter of fact, it was their first real activation in California. Yeah. And since, you know, it was just right after they had started in Puerto Rico and then they, they activated up there and it was really well done. Uh, they were for such a small headquarter people. I mean, there's only 35 people that really run the entire company. Yeah, small. And then the rest of everything's done with volunteers. Um, such as ourselves. You know, they've served over 25, <laughs> 25 million meals in over 400 cities. Um, they recently have um, started a new program in the COVID era where like good, good examples happening in Oakland right now. Um, a lot of people aren't get able to get meals. A lot of our industry people aren't able to get meals. So what they've been done is they've partnered with restaurants to, to help meet that demand. Um, they purchase the meals from the restaurants and then the restaurants um, will, will either like through DoorDash or Grubhub or, or, or Uber Eats or whatever, distribute the meals to people that need them. Uh, it's called Chefs for America, and it's really helped a lot of restaurants stay alive. A lot of chefs have a job. Yeah, a lot of yeah. folks have jobs that wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, we we remember we were doing 175 meals a day that were just going up to, to St. Helena. Well, they contracted with Mustard's restaurant in Napa to provide those meals um, so instead of, they closed instead out of the doing them out of Vacaville. So to kind of clarify, they're keeping the restaurant doors open so the employees of the restaurant can keep on rolling, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, they, they've, they've provided $90 million back to restaurants. And yeah. all across, the, they have a program that's going in, um, I know, New York, Napa, Oakland, um, not Washington, D.C. And I remember there was a couple that they mentioned I, I don't have off the top of my head. In the restaurants. Yeah. So those are the restaurant program. On top of all these emergency kitchens, they're on out there. On top of the fires, the um, Santa Cruz has been extended. Their numbers kept going up, so they're they're supposed to close out today. I'm going to look and see if they need anyone. If they're staying, if they've made a change, because they make changes really quick. They you sure know, do. They Amy, I wanted to bring you in, Amy, because you when we were there, you know, for those people who weren't had didn't doesn't, didn't see what this looks like, right? You were expediting distribution. Like, how many meals about were we doing on average? every day and then how many different places were they distributed to you had to kind of organize all that 
Uh, it was about set between 650 and 700 meals a day. Um, that's lunch and dinner. And they got lunch and dinner at each location. There were about six, seven locations um, from places locally in Vacaville to all the way up in um, St. Helena, uh, which took what, an hour and 20 minutes to an hour and a half to get the food up there. That's why that restaurant comes in handy. Now they're doing it. Um, where else? I mean, think about that. Think about that. They got to drive all those tiny. They have to drive all those tiny. Little, they have to drive all the tiny little roads to get oh, yeah. there and everything. Oh, yeah. Those are those are volunteers too. Those yeah. are volunteers. Yeah. Too. They they rely. Everything on, is volunteers. everything is volunteers and and what they what they tell you because we ended up running the kitchen for them is use the volunteers. The volunteers are here, whereas we're used to just taking control and doing things. You want every volunteer, they're there for a reason, give them something to do. Doesn't matter what their skill level is, give them something to do because they're there and they want to help. And everybody yeah, and contributes I, and everybody feels better that they did, you know? Yeah, so, I, I, uh, I think that's a good point is, is if you feel like you don't have enough experience, hey, there's something that you, you can do. do. Yeah. You do. I, I want, I wanted you guys since, since, you know, I was mostly part of that, you know, making the meals and everything. Could you guys yeah. kind of paint a picture of that dish up experience, what that looked like for somebody uh, who's never seen anything like that? What did it look like as we were laying it out on the table there? Well, it reminded me a lot of a wedding, a plated sit down dinner, but in boxes, honestly, it was just every table lined up with uh, what we do at least 50 at a do time, about 80 at a time. 80 at a time. Um, and then I'm at the end putting them in the hot boxes. The hot boxes are labeled, they're counted, everything, you know, everything going in and counted because, uh, you know, you don't want to screw up the order <laughs> on the other end. It was, um, it was kind of amazing, so, you know, because, you know, only 80 at a time and we're doing how many meals at each meal period. So it's not just one line, right? Yeah. And they really want to cut it close with when the drivers arrive. They don't want it sitting in a in a warmer, um, they want it to be as fresh as possible. And Jose is all about plating and you eat with your eyes and everything's garnished. And their food, in my opinion, is top notch. I don't think you're gonna get that out of another organization, not to, not to you know, talk crap about any other organization that feeds people <laughs> food, but um, not, not really like good. those other guys, right? They have hey, a new me, you mentioned, they you have mentioned a the food. You mentioned the food. Let me bring in uh, those. A few sent me a few pictures. Let me bring those in. Okay, real quick. Okay. Let's see if I got them. Where'd they go? He Here they are. He wants to start a plate. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> right. That's a great shot. And there, are folks that are watching, they can see they can see the table. The, the box is going straight up the table. There, right. People on yeah. either side. There's distance between the people. People are wearing gloves. People are wearing masks, right? In case oh, yeah. people are wondering about that stuff, right? Um, let's see. That's a salad. Nice little salad. Sweet little salad shot. That's that's sweet, right? Yeah. There's some color, right? Yeah, the chickpeas. That's the black I like bean sauce. Black bean sauce, uh, the chickpeas. That wonderful beef, roasted chickpeas. Yeah, pepper beef. Wonderful. Mashed potato. Uh, Blanche broccoli by Mr. Dave Nelson. Yeah, good job on that broccoli. Oh, did I pick that? Did yeah, I pick nice, that? And green, it nice and green. It didn't die at all. It's, it's, a good it's all a big blur. <laughs> <laughs> Between that and the penne pasta, there's not much. You know. But you know, hey, nutritious, you know, there's a lot of meat in there, there's a lot of protein in there, and that's what people need, right? You know, and, and yeah, we're not they, keeping on portions either. That looks pretty good. And they you know, insist. Well, you know, the other big thing about that too is you know, we made made it smell really nice. So when, you know, nice aromatics with the green onions um, and the sauce is a good aromatic to it. So when you open it, you get that face full of fresh, um, you know, you're not just getting blah, you're getting this smell of fresh vegetables, a smell of fresh herbs. Um, Here's that, was good cauliflower that was some good looking cauliflower. And, and you can see, I mean, it's even got a little roasty crust on the outside. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, that's what you're looking for, for a roast. They have this gal that volunteered, Jen, yeah. who was just the veggie queen. She's I a vegetarian. Mean, she said, can I do the veggies? We said, you can do the veggies all do, you want. We would do 500 meals, and the veggies were like, 
could have been their own meal. They, she just, she loved she, it. She did a great job with them. She was great. She really moved well in the kitchen. Here's, oh, this is a nice one too. Look at the colors going on in this plate, right? Pulled pork, sweet potatoes. Pulled pork, sweet potato mash, some fresh Little veggies. Veg. Yeah. This is this is all for, for people who don't have a home at that time. This is all for pe first responders, right? It's, it's, it's doing good work, guys. And uh, there's the logo for World Central Kitchen, who yep. again, we have no permission to use their logo, but there it is. Oh, but then we can say, please donate, volunteer, <laughs> go to WCK.org. Um, you know, <laughs> one of the other things about those two is like, and, and I don't, a lot of people may not be aware is how they find these, the people. Um, a lot of the people that we were feeding we were sending like 15 meals to a hotel or 20 meals to another hotel. And it was Romero who is on the ground with us, who works for World Central Kitchen. He's their director of relationships. Yeah. He'll, he, he has developed this done, guy. amazing skill of finding people in need. Um, he was up in the fire the other day. He was up in in the St. Helena area and he came across a family that needed help and they, they didn't have anywhere to go. So he helped them get into a hotel, make sure that they had meals delivered to them They got meals every delivered day. to their hotel every day and they were checked on every day to make sure they were okay. And it was just, and, a, what about 15 people? And I think that, that small scenario really incorporates, encompasses everything about World Central Kitchen. Um, the heart everybody has. that whole thing of they go out and look for people in need they don't wait for people to come to them and say oh can we get some meals um on their twitter page in lake charles they're in lake charles texas right now and there's four activations there and they go out into the disaster zone when they're out handing out food looking seeing if there's people in areas that are like oh my gosh these guys are camped out underneath you know, a broken down house. Let's go. Let's go find them services. Get them help and find them people, people have no idea that there is help available, right? And right. I, and I love how you mentioned. Times. I love how you mentioned that it, it is just kind of their mission, right? To go out there and just do what it takes to get it done, right? Find you well, find people that are hungry on the street. They can't, they find them a damn hotel and give them some food. You know, it's just they're chefs. Our and they just about that. Our industry is about. You know, we're about taking care of everybody else. I mean, and each other. That's all we do. Take care of everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. It, it fits your mission statement as well. I gotta say, that's that's yeah. uh, good stuff. I, I wanted to kind of, I wanted to kind of shift gears back to you guys. Okay. So, um, let me throw a question out to you guys. How long have you guys been cooking together? And and what are some of the places? How long we've been cooking together? Nine been, years. Nine. Well, we've been married for thirteen. Uh, yeah, nine we years. Started culinary nine years ago and no eight years It'll started be, papa dale's driving was papa dale's first we started we started the food truck industry with our with our food truck over eight years ago september 23rd will be our eight year anniversary um we started in march of 2012 um we've been going strong ever since and it's, it's just been pretty much the two of us and every once in a while somebody else wanders in the door and hangs out for a little while and then either Bye. can't either can't cut it or it's too tough or it's too hard and you know it's a as we all know I mean it's a difficult industry alone just just restaurant just food service in general and then you add the mobile aspect to it it's definitely not makes easy. you a better cook. Oh God! Having yeah. a food truck oh, yeah. because <laughs> you can't just go to the walk-in and get something. If you start to run out of something, you're at an event, you can't leave. What are you gonna do? You close your door. You have five minutes to figure out, rewrite a menu, and that's what's so fun about it. You can sell anything that you want. Well, to, that's one of the things. The reason you know, why you know when we were, we're when good. we were, we're doing this it. this thing at World Central Kitchen, you know, we walked in the coolers and you know. We had like three, four fun. days of activation and we didn't want to bring in more product in. So we just were like pulling this and here and yeah. this, you know, like if we don't, we were short on one thing, we add something else to it to, to make it work. Um, Ultimate goal was to have nothing in that walk-in, <laughs> but all the dang parsley that they had. <laughs> all that's left was parsley and cilantro parsley, and green onions. 
and a little bit of potato, very little left in there. We did a awesome. good job at, at making it work and figuring it out with what they had, you know? Mission accomplished, mission yeah. accomplished. I mean, we, we definitely, I mean, in the in the eight years since we started running our truck and we've all, we've both grown an insane amount. Um, we've learned so much. Uh, we could probably teach a PhD level class on it. And um, catering and, well, and catering. And a lot of the biggest thing, I think one of the things we saw with changes in the industry is just the lack of drive in a lot of people. Um, you know, the lack of try. Uh, we started in an industry when we first started here in Sacramento, there were only 13 trucks. Like we were the 13th truck, food, gourmet truck. Was that how many I thought it was less? Gourmet truck at the time. Now there's over a couple hundred. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. there's, always yeah. been, there's always been the Luncheras, there's always been the taco trucks for like 20 years. But yeah. gourmet trucks, Specialty, the, whatever. but the, the difference in, in, in the business model, you know, you have the, the catering truck that's basically a 7-Eleven on wheels that goes to the different locations and stops and brings their, their cool bell. You know, there's that one. And then there's the taco trucks that will go sit at an industrial site location and just sit there eight hours a day, you know, um, there's most of those guys have been in their spots for 15, yeah, 20 years. We know. And then you have us, the, the, the gourmet trucks. I say gourmet because I hate that word in general, but the specialty trucks, specialty. the ones that yeah, are. You do events. You do events. And yeah, themed. we well, do not themed trucks. We also, you know, we only go and out for concept. like two hours. We'll go out for a lunch service for two hours. We won't go sit somewhere for eight yeah. hours and hope people show up. We yeah. have plan things where we go to it's set up in advance by reservation so you're guaranteed to make money and then when we park in the same place that a taco truck does they're like i don't understand what you do you leave for two hours you come back you get ready again you go out a couple three four more hours then you come back i don't understand this because they just go out for you know morning to early evening they're they're home by five eight what they do eight to four are their yeah are their hours so trying to explain it to them they're like okay well that makes sense people already know that you're coming it's a business park they know that you're coming they have your menu they're going you're there you're the, their food so that's the difference between the trucks but um yeah so what fun. have you guys what have you guys been doing since COVID started have you been getting out there in the truck uh, at all or not so much? I mean, not so much. The problem is, is, is food trucks really we require a crowd. You know, a lot of a lot of times people yeah. book food trucks. They're like, oh, but there's lines and people want. You we know want what? Lines. We want lines. That <laughs> means want there's it. people waiting. We have lots of customers. We like that. Um, whole lot of nothing. About the first two Did months. Some pop ups. Pop ups were okay. First two months, I think we just physically recovered. You know, we closed our restaurant. We had a restaurant for a year. Uh, we closed it, so that was a lot of physical recovery from from that. And then I think yes. just kind of kind of mourned. I mean, for lack of a better term, beyond we, kinda, yeah. we mourned the loss of our businesses, you know, and saw, but also our our industry. We felt the grief for our industry. You know, we we, we grieved for those of our friends and brothers and sisters in the industry who are struggling and who lost everything, and you know a lot. A lot of the people, you know, like like us, you know, own their places, had difficulty with getting unemployment, even, you know, and you know, surviving on that. that. Yeah. Um, you know, and really, there was a lot of a lot of sadness, a lot of grief, and then um, after after uh, sleeping a lot, after decided. <laughs> yeah. So, so what did you do then? What did you do next? Because you guys just just went on a vision quest. So one day, literally, literally said, on Wednesday, screw it, let's get the hell out of here. And I said, I'm sick of my porch. That's so doing nothing. I wanted to go on, <laughs> on Friday, on Friday at 2 a.m. <laughs> we threw everything, threw a couple of suitcases in the back of our Ford F-150 and headed out yeah. to visit our friends in Wisconsin. The original plan was just to go to Green, well, they live in Green Bay, Menasha actually, which is just south of Green Bay. 
Uh, the plan was just to go out, visit them for a few days and come back and just see, you know, the South Dakota and see Wyoming and, and that. And, uh, right, right. It, and I, I bought, I got to say, I saw you guys on this trip. I mean, you were like posting the whole time. So I'm like, oh, wow, they, they up it, well, oh, The original plan was 11 days uh, and it ended up being 30. We yeah, stayed we out for 30 for days. Um, it was pretty cool. I mean, the first, we, we headed to Nevada, then we went, the first stop was Salt Lake City, and then we went up into Wyoming, through uh, Casper, Wyoming, and then up through Buffalo, Wyoming, across to- you, were you, Can I slow you down there? I mean, were you hitting some, were you doing food research along the way? I mean, can you talk you about know, that? We did a hell of a lot of eating. We really yeah, did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the biggest things that we did when we started off was, you know, when we started getting into areas, the towns and stuff, was to try to do everything local restaurants, no uh, chains. Unless, you know, we're, we really had no choice. There's a couple couple chains we tried out, like Taco John's. Taco and, John's is way better than Taco John's. Oh, my God. It was so good. <laughs> was okay. well, I was in Missouri. It is, it is Taco John's, everybody. And then um, it's tacos. I don't know. But we tried to eat local. And for a lot of places, we tried to get, the, get their specialties. Yeah. Um, when we were in um, South Dakota, we... we we never did find a good Chislick place. Um, my friend has one in South Dakota, and we weren't able to get out to see her. Chislick is... Um, yeah, you need to kind of describe it for everybody. We would call it kebabs and skewers. Kebabs and skewers it's yeah. Chislick. It's, there. it's the South Dakota dish. It's basically it's skewered, skewered meats. Um, it's pretty epic, and unfortunately, we missed out on getting some of those. You couldn't find any, huh? Well, everything's the, shut everything's, down. A lot of things are closed, so that was really difficult. Oh, of course. Yeah, we did, yeah. we did eat in a restaurant in Sturgis. We, went to we were Sturgis. in Sturgis two, two weeks before everybody got there. So you didn't go to I want to make sure you yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but that was one of the biggest challenges of the entire trip was, was we wanted to go eat at the restaurants that we, we knew or we knew of or people we knew and everything's closed. Um, you know, uh, we got to- We, we were, did a lot of Walmart uh, shopping and had a cooler and made sandwiches along the way all in that stint until until we got further on to our trip when things were open because yeah. there's just it's so rural through there there's really not the towns a lot are not corn. very big there's a lot of corn yeah there's corn, <laughs> and there's more corn and that's green, about all there is is corn but the uh, <laughs> the biggest i think our first our first major food stop was chicago yeah we yeah. got to chicago and we um we, the hotel that we found, we, we once we got into where there was more um, boutique hotels, we started staying at some of the really cool kitschy places to kind of, you know, have a little bit right. less of the stuff. But when we got to Chicago, we we wanted a Chicago dog I really bad. I never had bad. a Chicago dog. What was the name? Portillo. I had two. So we walked, there was, <laughs> I had a, two. <laughs> there's a place in um, Chicago called Portillo's, Portillo's yeah. that is legendary for their dogs. So we left our hotel, it was pouring down rain. It's raining on us, we're walking. And we're walking down the street and I look at the restaurant that we walk by, I'm like, I know the name, why do I know this name? It was Frontero, which is Rick Bayless's place. Oh, and okay. oh my God, this is Rick Bayless's place. And this of course it's closed, it's closed. And it's all closed, I'm like, ah! I'm standing right here next to Rick Bayless's place, Frontero, and I can't and eat there. And what was the other? Oh. I'm I'm going on a trip here pretty soon, and you guys are bumming me out. <laughs> well, we uh, when well, we're going to eat, you know, you know, we're in Chicago. Gotta go visit the Linea. Linea. Yeah. So we drove over to find it. We literally passed it like four times because there's no outside there's no signage. signage. Yeah. So I got it. I saw. And I, I literally stood in front of the door and worshipped at the the shrine of Linea for a little while, and I was really blown away by the. Um, <laughs> The side I expected. I mean, the frontage was like somebody's house or something. That was really it was in crazy. a neighborhood. So from there we went to St. Louis. Now St. Louis, um, 
I've got some friends, David and Megan Sandusky. They own, right now they're up to four restaurants. They own, they own um, the Beast, Beast Craft Barbecue, uh, Beast Butcher and Block, and they're opening another place coming soon. Um, but this dude, David Sandusky, I met him through. The name, name's familiar. I think I got him as a Facebook friend. I, I you probably um, him, yeah. this guy, need to be his friend. He, uh, when I was at the um, state fair, as the chef of the state fair, he came out to visit and we got to, he got his wine right on. <laughs> like, I'm I mean, listening, sorry, guys. I'm listening. <laughs> yeah, and um, we just hit it off. And since then, we talk all the time and we've become really good friends. And when we stopped by his place, we met him at their restaurant, their beach craft barbecue over there in Belleville, Illinois. Belleville, yeah. And he sat, we stood talking and he comes out with this tray of food. And I, it was I, a cookie I, sheet. It wasn't I swear, like a small tray. I swear the angels started singing and I, a light opened up in the sky. You guys and, posted this. You guys posted this. I think I yeah, saw yeah. Yeah. And it. And he told us the story of how they, they they, they source the most amazing pork. It's this beautiful, humanely raised meat. You know, we have one out here in the area, Yano Seca, we were talking about before, that raises these amazing animals. And like they say, that pig has one bad day in its entire life. Right. And it goes to see the nice man. Yeah. The, the quality of the pork, these pork steaks, I've never had pork steaks before. It's a slice of the shoulder that slow smoked. So it's, a, oh my God, I'm, I'm craving it now. I need to go. I will forever crave it. It's yeah, just can like, I just say, I, I don't know if you know, but I was working at uh, the V Miller butcher shop there. Yeah. And so I'm getting that Yano Seco all the time, right? That's their, their supplier, right? And I dream about that stuff at night. It tastes so good. I just had two sirloin chops the other day. Yeah. Again. You know, uh, just one of those off market cut. And it's one of those porks that you just salt and pepper. That's yeah. all you need. So the meat is yeah. so good. So the meat is so good, so high quality, and so humanely treated that um, basically the animal speaks for itself. And he said he has all these rubs, he has all these things he always did. And it's, he's like, nope, it has to be just basic salt and pepper because. The meat's so damn good. Well, you know, the thing about like, barbecue... It doesn't taste, like, cheap and muddy and sweaty and gross. Well, the thing about barbecue amazing. Is, is barbecue... It's amazing. Barbecue is, is a, a cooking style or a... a <laughs> that's kind of used for cheap meats. Yeah. Because it's low and slow. It's heavy sauces. It's really used for cheap cuts of meat. So when you put good quality meat mixed with the great woods and that you get a, a product that's just sublime. And that is the, yeah. I mean, you take like, for example, Indian cuisines or certain other um, cuisines that are, are poor man or peasant food that are, are spicy or heavy or are really, um, it's just simple, like, simple yeah, good, it's, you know, it's, cuisine, it's designed right? for like cheap. French onion cheap meats cheap produce maybe produce that's older that you can't get older meats gamier meats um so when you take that wonderful flavor profile then you add a quality meat to it it just elevates it like you won't believe i love it, so I his, love it. his barbecue this trek yeah. we gotta talk about this trek it, it, it has almost Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. The potato salad was amazing. What was the, what's that uh, kind of dressing you said was in it? The mayo. Oh, it's Duke's mayo. He's like, I know it's Duke's in here because it's just oh. really, really, really good. Very creamy, delicious, perfect flavor. Um, it, we had some tortillas on there so you can make a little taco. We had pickled onion. We had everything under the sun. What is that um, pig face stuff he was talking about? Oh gosh, I don't remember the exact name he gave us on it, but he has this. Want y'all or just? It's, 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 the, it's actually the snout it's in that. The, everything but the snout. Here's the 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 There's pork. There's the tray. Tray. <laughs> Look at that shit. Now that's all <laughs> me. We ate that. We ate that. That's oh yeah. Tray, yeah. 
Yeah, it's crazy big. <laughs> Beans, slaw, nope. you name it, everything. Turkey, Sides were delicious. It sounds pretty inspirational then, guys. Are you thinking of uh, kind of going down that road, getting into, you know, all natural and, uh, you know, trying to get something going or what are you guys well, thinking? always been about using, I mean, when we started the truck, the thing that was always really awesome about the truck is that a high person in the background. <laughs> There's somebody about that. Somebody's in your house. There's Dave. somebody in your house, Dave. Um, the thing about when we started the truck, the great thing about having a small footprint you know, doing only 50, 60 covers, maybe a hundred covers is we can buy and having to buy everything fresh is we were able to buy a lot of stuff straight from the farms. Yeah. Uh, we were able to buy a lot of farm fresh stuff because of the fact that unlike a hotel or a large service restaurant, which was my major background is I, I can buy 10 pounds of something. I don't have to buy 200 pounds. Yeah. Sure, so sure. I can go to the farmer's market at, at, at X under the freeway and get some quality fresh products right that I can use right then and there. And, and a lot right, of the places. The and so when it comes moving forward uh, to, to our next incarnation or whatever it is we choose to do, there will be some pretty heavy barbecue influence in there. But it, barbecue done our way and not, not heavy sauces um, yeah really let the meat speak, let the for, meat speak itself. for itself we've always been yeah. into like i don't like more than five ingredients in a dish i really you, you, you know when you work me on that so you see i try to keep everything real to the point and not not so much as like one ingredient and let let the carrot shine but let's let the carrots with some parsley a little balsamic vinegar so that the carrot tastes like a carrot it's but it's still yeah. got some extra to it some acid and that kind of stuff Absolutely, absolutely. How so, many people yeah. talk about acid as a seasoning? Oh, acid is huge. I mean, that's one of the things back in back in the past life. I, I used I worked at a retirement home feeding seniors. It's better for you than sodium. You can't use a lot of salt, and acid really helps pull the, the salt and make the flavoring good. And that's yeah. a great yeah. tip for anybody, right? Great tip yeah. for anybody. Oh man, a I'm little not. squirt of acid. So we, um, we enjoyed the barbecue in St. Louis, and then we had barbecue in Nashville. We've had yeah. barbecue in Memphis, yeah. Oklahoma. Went to Rendezvous in Memphis. That's where everybody says to go. Rendezvous. It was good. It was good. Their brisket is the shit. Brisket's amazing. Ribs. They have a different seasoning it's different. rub. It's the different. ribs were not quite as tender as I like. Um, I liked their rub. I love their sauces. I love their um, their um, vinegar based slaw. It was delicious. Their beans were delicious. We ate like tailgate style in about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Every place is going to be serving food now. Is going to you're be like on the yeah. back of the tailgate, just like covered in meat. Well, the thing about rendezvous in Memphis is trip because it's in an alleyway. It's in an alleyway. And, and uh, they had down, a line, they had downstairs. people driving up, they had, they were busy. They were still no, Memphis busy. was not. definitely different. I loved Memphis, that was my favorite. That was, that was different. The food was amazing, it was real simple. Yeah. Um, you know, and then we had barbecue in Louisville. 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 Oh, wait, go back to, go back to Memphis. I was just going to ask you about, uh, you, you went to Sun Studios, didn't you? Yes. We went everywhere. Oh my God. <laughs> I have to mention Sun that. Sun Studios. Right? That was, I mean, that was the highlight of Memphis for me. So Sun Studios, Graceland, the Martin Luther King Jr. What was the name of that museum? I don't remember. Uh, the Civil Rights Museum. Yeah, Civil Rights Museum. Um, shit. Dude, the Civil Rights Museum. We did the Johnny Cash Museum when we were in. Uh, so what Nashville. they what they did at the yeah. Civil Rights Museum is, uh, 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 I'll try the name of the hotel. I want to say Lorraine Hotel or something like that. The hotel that where Martin Luther King was murdered, where he was murdered, they, they switched, they changed it over to a, um, museum. a museum. So when you, interesting. when you walk up, when you walk up to the museum, the face, the front face of it is the outside of the motel and the, and the very spot where he was at, where he was, where he was assassinated. So, so if I could say, I saw your post and I saw you post in a motel and I, I thought, well, that looks like the pictures. I recognize the pictures. Yeah. Place. Yeah, that is the. Realized it was a museum. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a southern. It's the um, civil rights museum. Uh, the Lorraine. It's like a motel. Yeah, it's 
pretty much. Well, yeah. you know, and then, then there's, of course, there's controversy around that. We met a young, a nice young lady, not young lady, but a nice lady that has been protesting outside that, that museum for 35 years. She lived in that hotel. She lived in the hotel and then it was bought and turned into a museum and they, you know, they kicked out all the low income people that were living in this museum. Oh, wow. This yeah. The area is changing. They have condos, high end, Dude, you know, Memphis you is know. Just yeah, gentrification, I think. Gentrification yes. at its Major. finest. She was not too happy, and she's been standing on that corner bitching about it for how many years? 35, 35 freaking years. Oh, we gave her our time. We listened to her. We're like, wow, you know, thanks for talking. Oh, and then it's getting dark, so let's get the hell out of here because it's a little rough down there. It's a little rough. It's a little in rough in Memphis, you know. Um, hey, I, I was wondering if we could switch gears a little bit. Um, yeah. and Keith, I wanted to talk to you and kind of bring in a little career focus thing here. Um, because, you know, a lot of these are, my original idea was this was an idea for all of this was for, um, to bring, play in stu for my students in prison, right? I can't just bring people in there, right? And so I wanted to talk to you about um, the TV thing, right? You've been on a bunch of these t food TV shows and everything. I do the fake thing on my side, right? You know, but I wanted to kind of hear a little bit about you. Um, you taught at school. You know, half of those kids are thinking about getting into media sometime, right? Or at some point, right? So um, uh, I was thinking about uh, um, like, if you could kind of storyboard it for me, you know, what's it like to like, you've been accepted, what's the next step? You're going there, you show up and, and what's it like? Oh, geez, they've all been so different. Um, one of the great things I, I got really fortunate in that when I did the first TV show that I did, that was, it was Guy's Grocery Games. I did a couple TV shows with Guy Fietti, um when I worked for him. Just as a quick and guess, then, yeah. First so one you, I guys did, were, you guys were buddies already. Well, yeah, I was his corporate chef. Yeah. And then um, I did Guy's Grocery Games. And then after that, I did Cutthroat Kitchen. Um, the way the way the TV shows works is you apply, you send the video and all that. You and then, Skype. then you do a Skype interview. Um, if you are chosen, they will contact you. If you're not, you'll never know. You just, they won't even tell you, no, I'm sorry, we're not gonna choose you. Um, and then once you've been chosen, they fly you out, they give, they pick you up at the airport, they take you to the hotel, they, they take really good care of you, they take excellent care of you, get you to the set and all that. Now, most TV shows see, Cutthroat Kitchen was 13 and a half hours on set. Um, Long day. That's the kind of stuff I want to hear, right? Because yeah. one, you're there episode. For one, one episode, and, and you're the, the cooking. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are, <laughs> the cooking times are accurate. It's thirty minutes. It's thirty minutes. A lot of the other time is the the little things. Um, your hero shot, which is when they the the shot that they do when they introduce you. Then your losing shot, which is you actually film, you know, like on Cutthroat Kitchen, when you get kicked off, you see him going back down that hallway. Yeah, that's filmed before the show's even filmed. So you're um, acting, you're yeah. acting like you're yeah. losing, right? And then yeah. um, you do- Interview. For, well, we'll, we'll use Cutthroat Kitchen as an example because I've done everything from like scripted reality to <laughs> reality to, um, um, We'll, we'll use that one as a great example. So a lot of stuff is start and stop. There's a lot of cut spots, but once cooking starts, cooking starts. But like, for example, on Cutthroat Kitchen, the shopping, when you see people running in to go shopping, that's filmed three times. You film running in the st into there, then stop. Then you run in and you actually shop. shop that's, your, that's your get what you really need. And then the next one is you go in and do what we call a TV show. They call a TV shop, which is where you just grab everything off the shelves and make it look like you're hoarding a ton of stuff. And then you do a couple more of those. So um, that's managed drama right there. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Of, um, so there's a lot of little stuff where it's like at the very end, your dish is done. Little stuff like look at your dish. Pretend you're, you're wiping your plate, you know, little stuff that they can cut they in. They can add in. Um, and it will, you know, because like they want to create drama. So there's a show I did after that called Mamber's Child Chef Showdown. It was on FYI Network. 
I finished three or four or five minutes early on each round, but it made it look when they play aired it, that it looked like I was right, right to the second, but I was done and hanging out for five or six minutes. That's a good um, example. Yeah. Funny. But a good, you know, a good example of not being able to not hearing is I was, I auditioned to host Mamber's Child. After I did Cutthroat Kitchen, um, one of the producers was like, hey, we really like that guy. Can we get him on here? Um, and I you never. Got some, you got some panache, you know? Thanks. You stand out a little bit, right? Um, oh, let me go back real quick, because you'll see, actually, in all, all these shows, like Cutthroat Kitchen, it, we use that one as a great example, because Chopped, Cutthroat, guy. Guys Grocery Games, Mamber Shop, all those competition shows kind of use the same format. So while you're cooking, there's a producer with a notepad watching you on the screen, watching your camera people taking notes. So you know when you have a guy, uh, so I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do with these black beans. That's kind of a, that's filmed the next day. So it's you sit in a chair for six, seven hours and talk about everything you just did. And it's really kind of frustrating because it points out all the mistakes you made. <laughs> and, but uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's an amazing experience. Um, I highly recommend it to anybody that gets the chance. Um, if you're scared of being on TV, you're not, you're not on TV. It's not live. It's not live. Cameras. You know, you, you have the cameraman right there. The producers are right there, but they're cheering you on, man. They're your best cheerleader. They're like, you got this, you can do it. And, and they're kind of managing your every move, aren't they? Yeah. It's like, sometimes you got to freeze. It's like, don't move. Yeah, they're like, you know, I didn't get that. Like on Guy's Grocery Games, I grabbed something off a shelf and they're like, can you go back and grab that again? And I went to do it and I knocked over the gal that was following me around. But like <laughs> a great show, if anybody wants to get in there, I highly recommend applying for Guy's Grocery Games because Guy is so wonderful about helping you, guiding you through that show. He wants to have a great show, but he also wants you to have an amazing experience on his show. He doesn't just see that everybody that comes through there is like, you're just a person on the show. He meets everybody, he talks to everybody. He encourages you, he'll come up and be like, hey, that needs some more salt, man. Come on, hit that with a little he bit more salt. He pushes you. So you push that's you. a good entry level type of a show. That is a go for. Show. purposely push your buttons to make you mad so you work harder to win. Yeah, he's like, he can read people. He's really good at that. He is will that? purpose. Guy. Guy. Guy, yeah. Guy is, an, is, is pretty amazing. Um, I was going to ask you, like, like, who really stands out of the, those um, food? Hollywood food people you've kind of run into, whatever you want to call them, um, who really stands out above, head and shoulders above the crowd? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, bring in some gals too. So let's see, T, I'll just start, I'll just name all the shows we did. So we'll, we, um, Guy's Grocery Games, so Guy, Guy's amazing. Cutthroat yeah, Kitchen, Alton, yeah, Alton, yeah. Alton does not interact with the, with the cast at all, with the, with the people participating, other than, um, Comping during filming, he doesn't interact with anybody. We interacted because we shared a moment. Um, long story, but we, he and I shared a moment, and we got to talking. And I ended, up, you know, we ended up talking more during the show. Um, from that, I did uh, Member Child Chef Showdown. Adam Gertler was the host. Michael Isabella was our judge. Um, that was a good. That was a fun shoot. The kids were awesome. Um, that's gotta be fun yeah, yeah and then after that i did a food factory night shift we did for um at the california state yeah fair. it was for food network canada we did that at the state fair and then uh bar rescue bar rescue was john taffer wow. was like just amazing john taffer is so freaking smart it's disgusting yeah. um you know, that, that was an experience in free that business advice. Oh my God. The amount of advice you get from that man. It's pretty um, awesome. So I was a culinary expert on um, bar rescue. I did a, a place in Detroit called the hooch that had a kitchen. That was the um, name <laughs> it yeah, just right? hungry, right? It's the but, but first off, let me say that you know, Coochie, Coochie. The, yes. the staff Women. and the team at the Hooch were the most amazing people. 
uh, Melissa, Amanda, Cheryl, they were at Roach. They were unbelievable. The cook's name was Roach. Her. They they cared so much. They cared more about that bar than the owner did. And when you come in, you know, my whole thing was I was there to help these people. That's how I approach it. I'm brought in. I'm always honored when somebody asks for me to help them with something or wants me to use my experience or knowledge to make them better or bring in a separate set of eyes. So that was my goal. And I was there with Lisa Marie Joyce, who was our mixologist, who is probably the second best mixologist on the show. Sean's going to kill me for say, not saying he's the best, but Lisa Marie was the kindest most loving person and she was exactly what they needed um i'm bummed i didn't get a chance to work with phil wills or mia or sean ford i did just the one episode um and john tafford probably but, is the but ta in terms of learning about business and hospitality business john tafford was pretty outstanding um awesome stuff and then Moving. we did huh Chef Moonen. Yeah, I did a couple pilots with Chef Rick Moonen. Rick Moonen is amazing. That guy is, he is unbelievable. So awesome. And then so awesome. Um, we did Hallmark's Home and Family, um, which was fun in that we drove the truck around the back lot of the Universal Studios. Um, and after that, we did uh, Tom Carriage's American Feast here in, in Sacramento. They feature our, our Brussels sprouts. They featured Santana. They yeah, featured, yeah, featured Santana Diaz. And our party. <coughs> yeah. yeah. That's a guy you need to talk to, man. That guy is. Uh, he's already been on long time oh, the show. Santana, oh, that's right. I remember. Yeah, that Santana yeah. is freaking amazing. I love yeah, that. Yeah, he's, he's just like on everybody's list. We just saw him and Patrick the other day, and it was like, you He's know, drinking a beer with It was like Patrick. Zeus and Apollo were sitting on the, oh. on the streets, you know. These two are just... <laughs> These are two of my heroes, man. Yeah. Both of those guys. We love both of them. I have so much admiration for them. Um, so we when gotta, it, we got to get, I was going to say, we got to get Amy back in here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, sorry, I, it's yeah. the Keith show. Well, I didn't do all the shows. I did do a scripted reality and I do do the news and things like that. Yeah, we've done, we were regulars. Yeah. We were regulars on Fox 40. I, for I've about been two asked years. to do shows. You know, are you interested? No. I want her to do grocery games. I Not my thing. Fun. I think I you would, should, Amy. I would she would out there. She Everybody out there. Them, <laughs> good. Everybody out there thinks you should do it, Amy. They all think I should do it. By the way, Shalina's Shalini's giving you a, a oh, shout out. Hi. 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 Shout out, okay. Donnie's hi. out there giving you a shout out. Okay, she was in the kitchen with us the other day. Right. Hi, Donnie. Hi, Donnie. All right. Um, let's see. Who else? Michael. Going. We all shout out to you, guys. Peanut. 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 Peanut was in the kitchen with us too. The last day he was there. Right. Right. You were there with us the day that was the toughest because we had just taken over the kitchen. It was Friday and it was only the two of us, yourself and Hurricane Laura. And we had 400 lunches and 400 dinners to get out. Man, we were I, had to, I had to cut out midday. I left yeah. it out. Yeah, so, so at night, it was just the three of us. So every day beyond that was smooth Yeah, sailing. after we did that, everything was easy. I think I think you were prepped up for the next day, pretty much. The game. Well, that's what you gotta do. You have to get prepped up for the next day, so it's easier because the time flies, and you don't know how many volunteers you're gonna have. So I just was joking with you them, know. saying, "I guess this is the new initiation <laughs> to the family. Is we shove you into the kitchen, we give you no help, and we and see if you said, can do it. Wait until you're doing twenty thousand meals a day. But chef. see, the thing is, is, you know, and honestly, in, in, in terms of bulk cooking. 20,000 really is no different than 200. It's just as much work. It just takes a little longer, but it's the same amount of work. The math is the same. I mean, if you know, if you know your math on your numbers of your amount, no problem. Any, any amount can be done. And, and con the opposite is true as well. I mean, if you're going to do a party for a hundred, uh, somebody wants you to do the same party for 10 people. It's almost the same amount of work. It is work, the same always. Amount of work. And it's almost harder to do less. Always. Yeah. It's easier to make a big old sheet pan or a big old hotel pan of rice than a yeah. pot. <laughs> we, had a, we had a wedding that was supposed to be in March and 
the date changed, the venue changed, everything changed about it because of COVID finally happened. So we came back from this trip, gone 30 days, um, came back to, we have to come home because of this wedding, right? Right. All we would have been in New Orleans. <laughs> it was only 106 people. We would have been in New Orleans. We would have been Keep going, man. We, well, we, we were debating it. We were trying to figure out our time frame because we really had to spend a few days in Oklahoma City. Um, but when we were leaving we Memphis, when we were leaving Memphis, we all we had to do, it's the same distance. So from Memphis to Oklahoma City or Memphis to Mobile, Alabama to Louisiana. We because Mobile, there's our, our friend Pete. My, one of my biggest heroes of just a person is, is Panini Pete, who owns Panini Pete's and Ed Seafood in Mobile, Alabama. He's a personal hero of mine he's awesome. because he's just a rad human. You know, awesome. you just can't help but love this six foot seven. He's got to be almost ball. seven feet tall. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. we would have gone done that. We would have gone seen him. We would have gone to New Orleans. But, but we came back for the wedding. It was only 106 people, but right with what you were saying it was just as much work as if it would have been the 250 it was supposed to be originally yeah it was pretty the rad. same it's it's all and the same didn't you guys just did you roll into the kitchen right after that rolled right into the kitchen after that and then That's we also I had a catering guys. with the truck and went into the kitchen after the catering we basically came into world center kitchen on tuesday um saturday we did the wedding sunday we slept and recovered well you i did, did. I'm too old to, to pump these 14 hour days walking five out five miles a day anymore. I'm out of shape. You're a kid just, compared to me. I think I got about 10 or 15 years on you. Oh yeah? yeah. yeah. No, you're what, 51, 52, right? Yeah, keep going. Oh, come keep on. Keep going. You're not over 60 yet, are you? Uh, maybe, I don't know. No, oh, come on. Dave. I'll ask my uh, wife. No. Wife. She keeps no, track I, of I, I, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I'm 50 years old, man. I'm 50. an old man and a young man. He's going to be 51. Dude, 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 dude you're running rings around those kids in that kitchen this weekend. Dude, I always have. I have since I was, since I was, you know, 40. You just have to hear him when he gets up out well, of his I, chair. Well, when I get up out of the chair, it's it sounds like, like popcorn. <laughs> Okay. Everything hurts. Okay, there's a reason why I keep going and I run rings around because if I stop, yeah. everything seizes oh, up and it hurts. Yeah. yeah but the, the adrenaline kicks in, man, and, and yeah. you know, it keeps you going. It's adrenaline. No, if, I can, great. if I can give one piece of advice to to anybody that is um, wants to do, whether it be TV or live TV, is um, be comfortable with people staring at you while you work and learn and asking you questions and learn how to describe what you're doing. Yes. Um, also the biggest thing is honestly what I think saved me and really helped me a lot was I have really good knife skills because yeah. when, when you're cutting, if your knife skills are, are shaky, having the cameras around and having people watching you can really mess you up. I mean, that, you, got, uh, you got fun hands too, man. You got ink all over them and everything. So there's right? a reason why it says chef on my hand right there <laughs> is so that when I'm holding my knife and you cut in on a close up, you can see you can it. see it on TV. Uh, <laughs> it did perfectly. Yeah. And, uh, hand honestly, you know, food, when you're 70, food TV you is not real. Food TV is not real. It is, it is. Well, what is over here, baby? Well, over here, you know, the, the I'm saying the competition shows and, you know, like oh, the, yeah. the, the travel shows are great. I love what he guys done for everybody. Um, food TV is going to change after COVID. It's going to be a whole different world. I, I personally like the informational. I like Bar Rescue and that you watch an episode of Bar Rescue. If you're paying attention, you can learn a lot. Right. It's school. Yeah. You can yeah. learn a lot. Triple D, people don't realize. I mean, guy has seen over 1,500 different things. And if I see something, I see Dave does it this way, and then John does it the same way. And this guy, they do similar. Hey, this might be a technique that really works. Right. And, you know, and 
Dave's got this method of making carnitas that I've never seen before. And it comes up, excuse me, amazing. I've now learned something new. White boy carnitas right here. Yeah, right man. on. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. So um, let's see, we, we mentioned Santana Diaz a minute ago. Um, what other food person or persons are blowing your mind in the Sacramento area these days? Your, your guy that have it coming on Monday, Chris. Chris, I, I freaking adore that guy. I have so much respect for him. He has, I mean, I remember watching him when he first opened Localis and the shit he went through with Localis and that. Um, he's punk. He's a punk rocker. Yeah. He's, he's just, we have never really interacted much. I, we sat next to each other for the Blues Traveler concert at the State Fair a few <laughs> years back. But, you know, concert. Uh, we have we have a lot of the same philosophies and interests and i i'm a huge fan of the dude so chris just so you know i i i, I stand on you man I'm, i stand on you i stand i fully I'm exactly stand you. The same way. Uh, no yeah. i stand stands that new kids turn that's that whole fanboy thing oh. dude, i'm a big fanboy of chris uh of, of patrick patrick mulvaney um yeah yeah, yeah. Santana. um santana you're, you're talking to another one, uh, Robin Patel, when he was with Sullins. I mean, we were very fortunate in that as a food truck, we participated in the restaurant stuff. We bridge did dinner, all of the bridge dinner. Awful. We did have an awful day, sausage fest, bacon fest. Yeah. We were the only food truck that participated in that because I don't well, it see It made us. sense with you guys. It made sense. There's a lot of visibility. Well, I don't see I us as any different. Table. We're no different than, than than a Mulvaney's. Just we don't have a place for you to sit. I just wanted the only important part, and that's the kitchen. I didn't need I don't need a server station and all that junk. I just need a place to make food. Um, you know, and that was the biggest thing was because I'm on six wheels doesn't mean we're any less culinary gods than, than the other gods i mean we are every bit as good as the restaurants in town i just happen to give it to you in a disposable <laughs> and not i don't waste money on shit that doesn't matter yeah. you know tablecloths and napkins you know um, <laughs> was, i guess i hate to say it but you know nowadays that stuff kind of doesn't matter Right. It doesn't. doesn't today, does it? I think I think we're going to see. We talked about this today. I think the food trucks are more positioned to be able to provide service uh, in the afterworld, as I'm calling. It's going it. to be. It's going to be weird. It's going to be a different because you know we're used to restaurants putting in a million dollars into their decor, or their ambiance. It's an experience, and we just learned that it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter anymore. All of those million dollar restaurants are kind of out the window right now. Well, the, um, they, yeah, don't, say they it, don't seem to, this is why one reason why I am so impressed with Chris and Localis is that they're doing everything to go and it's as beautiful as it would be on a plate. And that's talent because you have to, you have to really take the time to let something rest, see how long it's going to last, make sure your packaging is right, all that, because you don't want it to be shit when it gets to the person. And, so, and this is the sort of thing that regular folk don't understand. No, they don't. And in the food truck world, we do the same there. thing. You know, he made a chicken sandwich and we did different different uh, recipes for the breading a million times to fit to figure out what was going to work best. We make it, let it sit in a, in a box. Let it different, sit. Different types of boxes. Like when we did our burgers. I don't want it to be crap when you get it. A lot oh. of people gave us shit because we used styrofoam on our to-dos. Well, the reason we did that was because when we got the compostable and we put our big fat burgers in the compostable, the amount of steam and stuff generated was the, they were falling apart. Falling apart. <laughs> so we had to go with something that can contain the food. So it was like not just as much and as the we weather. Believe, as much as we believe in compostable, we believe in sustainable product and that I could not with good conscience send you my food yeah great this is a great container but the food turns into mush or... not to mention we're outside so you need to think about weather if it's 40 degrees out 
and I'm serving you food in earth friendly container it's gonna be and cold. not styrofoam, your food's cold in a minute. Yeah. So. I think I think everybody's gonna have another giant COVID slap in the face when winter time starts and all these oh, that is no. just no. devastating. Well me. unfortunately everybody's starting to let up with it and um they're starting to get lax again and I, it scares me. I, I don't know who's gonna be going out to eat. Uh, again I think you know learning how to cook for yourself a little bit is a survival well, skill. We this. gotta be watching your show Dave. Well I haven't done a uh, cooking show for a while. Uh, <laughs> That was going to be my last question, guys. Okay, how do you guys feel about coming back to drop some actual, uh, like a culinary demo on a fake show here sometime? I, I would love to talk to you about having doing a show on your network. Dude, we could we could do a regular thing. I want to just I want to have other people on here. I don't want to do everything, and uh, um, I I think I got my toe in the door of a little little forum here, a little platform. Can I use here. that pan? I can use that pan right there. And uh, it's kind of a deep. This one. They're all behind him. Yeah, he can't see you pointing behind him. She's like, she's like pointing at you on the screen, like you can see it. They're behind you. <laughs> Look at your wall. Like, can I work? Can I use that one? Yeah, I've been working on. I'm working on some scripts for some stuff for TikTok and that kind of stuff on food history and uh, food science, little quick breakdown stuff. So we'll have that coming up in a little bit. Yeah food history uh, to me we, we were talking what? about the um the uh what was it called the culinary food timeline or something the, yeah. oldest, the oldest internet site uh, on the internet yeah the oldest yeah. Website on the internet there's a uh, definitely a lot of um i'm a big fan of that i'm a big fan of why we do what we do i'm a big fan of restaurants and their history um whether they be good or bad um i really also love how you know different foods came into the bean in the united states um, and when and why and by who but how it all started areas. was i i got hired i was at the the double tree in modesto and we had a um renaissance fair group at the hyatt at the sorry at the double tree, double tree. and so the cool wanted, kids were there yeah they <laughs> wanted they wanted uh, a period dinner from the renaissance That's so awesome. i i got this book called shakespeare's kitchen that is authentic Shakespeare period it's kitchens. And, I've seen uh, that book. I've seen that around. Yeah. yeah. I've become really good friends with the author over the time because I talked a lot, asked a lot of questions. And she turned me on to this great cookbook called Take a Thousand Eggs or So. And it's cooking in a castle and it's cooking sure. in um, yeah. So those are the kind of things I'm fascinated with and, uh, and we hope to share with everybody. Yeah, it's just a nerd. Yeah. That's a nerd thing. I'm a nerd. It's that's a nerd nerd. Nerd. That's a that's a good place History, to leave. Science, cooking, you know. Well, that. that's a good place to that's a good place to leave it right there for the yeah. nerdy crew. Nerdy. That's, that's why we are. Thanks a lot for showing up. Good to see you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for doing what you guys do. You're Thanks in. Thanks for the ghost in the background. <laughs> You better believe it. I think we're going to see you guys again at a, uh, another uh, World Central Kitchen here. Uh, I hope so. Well, if uh, there's still a lot going, we're going to go down later this week to Santa Cruz. Yeah, I'm thinking about it too. I'm going to run okay. out of stuff to do here. So, uh, um, yeah, I'll probably see Dude, you guys. No, well, we can, maybe we can all carpool. Oh, that sounds right. great. And if I go, I'll be posting that to the uh, Facebook crowd and everything and get for everybody on there. Uh, yeah, people are still waving at you and all, guys, but uh, we'll let you go. I want to shout out to everybody else. Um, don't forget, I have loads of cooking vids and other fine, fine chef interviews with additional shows in the pipeline. Knock it off, you guys. You'll be able to catch them all. You're at the tickling me. On Why YouTube. Are you touching me? <laughs> Remember, there's no finer gift to your loved ones than a completely free industry channel subscription. If any interactivity is your bag, baby, don't forget to follow and join the industry community group page on Facebook. That's where I do all these live vids and, and uh, shows and everything. Um, you can post your kitchen adventures alongside of chefs and teachers in a non-judgmental educational forum that's industry cooking community on facebook finally next monday the 7th that's labor day don't forget chef chris barnum dan is joining us for a between the tube session at 4 p.m on the industry community page on facebook that's the one we were just talking about that's all i want to thank keith and amy breedlove over there 
uh, for being here, but also for who they are. They do this stuff all the time. They are awesome. Check them and follow their exploits, please. I also want to thank uh -huh. Little Central Kitchen for everything they are doing. They never stop. Please go to W. Uh, wck.org and shower them with money. Watch for opportunities to help in other ways if you can. But again, shower them with money. They do it all with donations, guys. And they are truly a worthy group, not like some of those other guys, okay? For now, I'd like you to remember to be true to your food and it will never be false to you. And please do me a favor, don't you ever forget that the party is always in the kitchen, people. You can tell with these two guys right here. Let's go and get dinner fired up, guys. That's all I got. You're cooking. You're cooking. <laughs> we'll see you guys. Thanks a lot, you two. Hope you had fun. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dave.